Hi and welcome to a new episode of the State on the Net podcast. I'm Paolo Valdemarin. And I'm Ewan Semple. And today we're live together. Well, I think we're normally live, aren't we? I mean, yeah. We're kind of alive, but yeah. this day we're in the same place, recording, like sitting on two sides of a tiny table in it, my flat. It, it's weird. It, it is odd because we're so used to just talking into the computer or into the ether, or, but here we've got this weird thing called eye contact, and, and <laughs> it's, it's very strange. It's other, I, can't, I, can't, no, I, can't. I can't look up. No. Um, so, first episode of uh, 2020. Gosh, it is, you isn't see, it? The other strange thing is that I'm not hearing you in my headphones. I'm actually, yeah. It's, yeah. it's odd. <laughs> um, Better or worse, Paolo? Oh, it's always better. So, first episode of 2020, we have been a little bit lazy we just? in the sense that it's March and, uh, yeah. and time flies. We're sorry, we're sorry. Uh, we'll promise we'll try to do better. No, don't we give up promising. Uh, so, I guess that what, is, what has changed most dramatically since our last episode in uh, December is uh, coronavirus. Mm. It's uh, everywhere. I haven't been in Italy since December, pretty much, so I I don't have it. Well, I probably do, because I was saying I, I had lunch with one chap who's British but lives in China, and a lady who's Hong Kong Chinese, and I'm now taking the risk of not being remote from you, but sitting in front of you as an Italian, so my statistics have gone way up, I reckon, today. Yeah, no, well, no I, don't, chance. I don't think I'm going to make no. it to the end. <laughs> if I make it through the podcast, we'll be... <laughs> And, uh, well, a lot of things, it, I think it is interesting how the coronavirus is having an effect on uh, people, on movement, and it, it has had a very interesting effect of reducing the pollution in China and in Northern Italy. Like so has that been measured? That, that's yeah, a, yeah, that's yes, the pollution yeah. has gone significantly down. Um, so probably there's people there saying, oh... This is a nice yeah. air. Good. I mean, yeah. it's probably for the first time ever. Yeah. Well, yeah. even even you know even corporations here. I mean, I've been been talking to people who uh, you know maybe run events within a, an organisation, and they're saying, "Oh, we've had to do it remotely just to avoid the the risks of travel." And you know that could be a good you know always seeing the bright side of things. It could be a good thing if people became more used to doing things remotely and didn't feel such a need to travel all the time. I mean, I guess that people will find out that uh, stuff works. Mm. I mean, we have been using Zoom for almost all our communication for a couple of years now, and uh, it's just so good. It yeah. it works. It's uh, I actually think I get better audio with people on Zoom than in real life sometimes. <laughs> it's um, well, it's, I was talking to somebody earlier about Teams, uh, you know, and and the difference that that's making and that you know Microsoft in their own way seem to have got it right with with teams and that people are finding it easy to use and it's increasing remote co collaboration in a way that you know, some of us have been banging on about for for a very long time yeah it's interesting how it almost sounds like it's finally clicking in yeah. the sense that uh, we have been talking about this stuff for at least 20 years. Yeah. Uh, if you remember, I, I think one of the first application I had of the internet was CU See Me, which, oh, yes. oh, yes. which was a yes. Cornell University yeah, project. Yeah, I it. And Funny uh, little square videos. Yeah, it was a tiny little black and white yeah. video with a with a quick cam. The, do you remember the ball yeah, camera? Totally. And uh, and it wasn't very good. Yeah. But you would have thought that if we were already doing that in mm -hmm. what ninety five, ninety six, mm -hmm. probably, it took all of twenty five years yeah. <laughs> before we get good quality video conferences, but we now do, and it's... Uh... Well, I, I, it's funny, I thought you were going to take another tack on that. I mean, yes, it's surprising how long it's taken the quality to, to go up, but equally it's surprising how long it's taken people to use the bloody stuff. And But again, you know, since my, my older daughter's travelling at the moment, she's in uh, Thailand and Vietnam and Cambodia, and sometimes she'll call us on, on, on FaceTime and maybe I'm upstairs, my wife's downstairs, my daughter's, the other daughter's somewhere else. And we'll have these four-way, crystal clear, completely audible chats, informal chats, you know, taking for granted the fact that we're literally some of us the other side of the world. And, and 
and it's free and it's easy and it's quick and it's just you just press a button and off you go you know it's but still not impacting the world of work i mean that's where you think you're right with the coronavirus that that may be the thing that makes more people make more of an effort just to get over it and use the tools and yeah i mean it 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 is a type of event that will force because the the real challenge in in all these cases how do you cause a change in behavior yeah and uh, while threaten the change, them with death. well, yeah, the yeah threaten them to, to, <laughs> with death, and then saying, yeah, if you don't Not do it, yeah, it's like if you don't use conference, you will die. It's a pretty <laughs> good motivational way of getting, yeah. yeah. Uh, but um, it's definitely going to be interesting because I've, I've been seeing this even recently in meetings with people we work with. Uh, there is this tendency of saying, well, let's just have a call. Let's just have a, a the the moving in a virtual space, even with people that probably traditionally would have been more orientated to, you know, let's meet in person so yeah. I can kind of sniff you in real life. Yes. It's, uh, it's fine. And, and honestly, it's fine. The quality is good. And the, I'm not talking about the technical quality, but no. actually the quality of the interaction yeah. is good. I think people are learning how to use these tools. Yes. I'm trying to th think how to tell the story without being indiscreet, but I was involved in something recently with someone who was set up as an expert in digital who clearly hadn't worked out how to mute his microphone when taking part in a video call. So we all had to put up with him banging and clattering and moving stuff around on his desk. So I think it is the, the future's already here, just un unevenly distributed. Yeah, I mean, th there is there is room for improvement. The, <laughs> the, the fact that people don't understand that uh, the built-in microphone or their shitty PC is not good yeah. and is catching all the sound throughout the room yeah. and not just their voice. Oh, people do it in a big office. And, uh, it's yeah. terrible. But... Uh, but it is improving. I mean, mm -hmm. in some cases, we, we approach this by sending people headphones and mm -hmm. telling them, why don't you use this for a call? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's very, you can buy a pair for like two pounds these days. So, yeah. And it, they're better than the alternative. The new MacBook Pro that, as you yes, know, I with, need, with, like, yeah. uh, I can't leave Oh, I thought that. it was the Mac Pro you were going for. I thought you were really setting no, your sights no, higher, no, Paul. No, 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 I'm going for a MacBook Pro, the oh. 16, the, the one with a good keyboard. I was impressed. I thought you were really going for it. But it has a built-in array of microphones. Yeah. That depend, they, they call it, like, the studio. Well, I've heard a podcast done on them, because it's meant to be sort of podcast-ready Mm -hmm. microphones and he stopped doing it because he didn't think it was good enough but as far as I could tell it sounded fine you know it was, it was amazing quality so it is it but I remember it was since the first um, MacBook Air it was I think the first one that came up with multiple microphones to try mm -hmm. to create a beam and get mm -hmm. better better quality the problem is some PCs are bad I mean some PCs are terrible the quality oh, of the God, microphone yeah, yeah, yeah. is awful and yeah. you have people doing calls with yeah. those Recently, we have been using Zoom for webinars, and mm -hmm. we had up to 12 people streaming video all together, and uh, it works yeah. amazingly. You then get into, um, I did a thing for Cisco uh, what, a couple of years ago, about the etiquette and the practicalities of it. And you know, I remember when um, Google Hangouts first started, and they had this thing where if you made a noise, the camera automatically switched to you. So people who didn't mute the microphone and sort of sniffed and <laughs> it, was, it was chaos but even the thing about eye contact or looking interested or or you know, it's one of the reasons why I'm less convinced about it perhaps than some because yes it gets a bit closer to face to face but it also loses something in the fact that you've got all these slightly distracted looking faces you know well I think that there are some interesting uh, so especially being the one running the webinar yes you have uh, the power to mute people and unmute people which is interesting but because would be great if, if you could do it in real meetings well i i can i can use zoom <laughs> if it's your zoom call you can mute people it would be great if we could do that face to you know in real face, mute to face it, yeah. yeah 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 <laughs> yeah a mute point number <laughs> for real people yeah uh, and the other interesting thing is that uh, in the webinar control panel, you see if somebody moves Zoom in the background as an app. Oh, interesting. So basically, if somebody starts doing something oh, else, interesting. You, there is a little icon that fantastic. that flashes. Well, I, I, had, I had a great story about a group who were doing something with their boss and, uh, you know, team meetings, I think maybe half a dozen people. And it became quite clear that the boss had fallen asleep 
And so they, on, on, on the text chat, they were trying to work out whether they told him or whether they just pretended nothing had happened. <laughs> text chat, which, which was saved alongside... Well, that's, the, yes, that's the, probably incriminating the evidence, yeah, exactly. Anyway, things are changing. And um, something that, as usual, we were talking about before the call, um, about change and uh, coronavirus. Yeah. I was reading uh, in the last few days about... Uh, how the virus is spreading in Iran, mm-hmm. and uh, especially in the city, in the holy city of Qom, where the virus exploded first, and is basically a place where a lot of people are packed very, very tightly, and uh, it's the ideal yeah. situation to to for, for for a virus to spread. And uh, the government is not admitting that there is a problem. Uh, the clerics have said, actually, you should keep going there because yeah. it's a healing place. And I was thinking, at the same time, we do know how in Iran, the internet, uh, it's somehow controlled, but there, it's, it's a very thriving mm-hmm. scene mm-hmm. with a lot of local companies uh, running services. Etc. So yeah. I'm sure that there are channels of information. Oh, yeah. I mean, yes. we know people in Iran and, you know, there is... A, and the the distance in this situation between yeah. you know who believes in science and who doesn't believe in science yeah, yeah. becomes the difference between life and death and it's yeah. uh, well and not just that but authority and who you trust in positions of authority and you know it's not just iran where people are beginning to not wonder. believe in science oh yeah and, well. and, and they're the very same people who were buying on about the internet and fake news and all this sort of stuff and you think well okay which where's the fake news then you know who's who's perpetrating or, or promoting this fake news and what are their their interests in doing so and yes you've got a babble of noise and misinformation on the internet but it's becoming clear that that you know proactively managed fake news is is, is part of government these days I do think that at the same time, what what is going to happen is that uh, the hunger for actual information will probably make people a bit more, mm. you know, expecting an improvement. Because I mean, yeah. I've seen. I mean, what I have noticed in on on my very very partial, you know, corner of the example. internet yeah. is that uh, most of the information I I see a lot of information coming from experts and uh, being promoted yes i have seen some wacky yep. conspiracy theory but much less than usual i mean yes some politicians in italy some politicians tried to play the the, yeah. the 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 thing but they soon started started noticing that you know it's not worth being yeah. you know clever about it well, don't, it's don't, it's yeah. it's, a, it's a real problem it's not yeah. something where everybody can express an opinion and then pretty much everybody can you can walk away and nobody will ever yes, verify it. this is if voice. you catch yeah. it you catch it yeah. and actually there's a test that tells that you have caught it so yeah. i think that uh, suddenly the difference between what is real and what is not real is you can test it mm-hmm. and uh, if you look at the effort that uh, Facebook has done pretty much all around the world in trying to catch people discussing about the virus and mm-hmm. trying to to drive them to official sources of information yeah. like the NHS or in Italy the the yeah. whatever ministry so I do have the feeling that uh, in a moment where people are saying okay we got to take this stuff seriously I mean we can't start messing about we yeah, need to be serious like the flat earth or something it's, this is exactly it's, if, if we're talking yeah. about flat earthers it's like yeah, yeah. well the poor guy with his rocket yes yeah. uh but uh, this is like oh it's we, mm. we need to we we can't really be too serious no, I, mean, it, well, I mean generally i'm i'm the optimist on this stuff and i think human nature being the way it is we will eventually work it out and you're right i think situations like this pushers to learn faster. And in fact, this was true internally at the BBC. I mean, I remember big changes like, you know, BBC technology being outsourced or a, or a new director general, whatever. Those were points at which things just suddenly went up a level and because we were talking about stuff that mattered rather than what we'd put on the telly the night before sort of thing, you know. And, and I think as people become aware of that potential to have a higher quality of blah, blah, you know, then the whole 
the, the benchmark gets raised, you know? Yeah, it's, uh, it reminds me of, uh, I think it was my wife's grandfather who used to say, complain, when he was grumpy, complaining about something, he would say, you know, these youngsters, they would need a war to fix them. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. and to some degree, it's, you mm. know, when something major and serious happen, suddenly, probably prioritization becomes a little bit more meaningful and yeah, totally. uh, there is a realignment of things. Yeah. So, you know, to some degree, if everybody's suddenly being concerned about something very real, gets people to think more about, uh, you know, working remotely or where they find their information yeah. or who should govern them or it's maybe it's not that yeah, bad yeah. i mean a few people will die yeah, and if it kills uh, off all the old people who don't know how to you know use yeah, the internet we're that anyway. yeah, exactly. well we're all going to die anyway paulo actually uh, the, the event, at some point we're yeah. all going to die yes there is a an increased interest in I can't even bring myself to say the phrase the truth anymore but you know there's an increased interest in getting closer to the facts around something like this but equally the consequences of fear are becoming, you know, the, the fact that panic appears to be get increasing, you know, people buying in food stuffs and whatever. Even if the information is factual, we still have the amplifying effect of the internet to some extent. The fact that, you know, it's, it's but hard. We have it, but we have it both ways. So, I mean, it was, I think, at the beginning of last week, suddenly my stream on Facebook was, uh, oh, I, I went to the supermarket and, and it was, everything was gone, yeah. except for two types of pasta that apparently nobody wants to buy, even, <laughs> even in, in, even in life-threatening circumstances. Yeah. Uh, but the next day, most reports were, oh, I've been to the supermarket today. It was great because it was full, full yeah, of stuff and yeah, nobody yeah, was yeah. there. And the memes so, pass faster these days, don't exactly. they? Because they flush through quicker. Yeah. So it works both ways. Yes, yeah. you spread potentially you spread the panic, but you also spread the the. the I mean, the, the next day, literally everybody was saying, "Yeah, all right, oh, right. Yeah, yeah." The the super all the supermarkets are perfectly well stocked because, of course, these days, yeah. you know, in twenty four hours they stuck again at the supermarket. Yeah, and it wasn't. I mean, I'm not saying that like. There is a crisis as much as far as hospitals are concerned. I mean, there are, we will be testing some yes. parts of the infrastructure yes. to its limit. But where there isn't really an emergency, even when they, people start triggering panic, it dies out very quickly because... Yeah, it's interesting though, because somebody was making the point today that if the media had taken global warming as seriously and had scary stories every night about the consequences of global warming and how we all had to take measures to prevent it, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> it's because they haven't, really, to that extent. And in some ways, it's a greater, more pressing, more global threat, you know? Uh, the, actually, our friend uh, Luca de Biaza yeah. uh, wrote a very good post last week uh, on his blog commenting about how, in Italy, the press has been describing the coronavirus story even in, when it started in china as a global tragedy uh it was it was a uh, you know the narration the tone was that of yeah. the, the tragedy it already happened to, yeah, yeah. The, it's, yeah it's going to be it's, we're all gonna yeah. die yeah and of course once it started happening in italy and it, it turns out it happened in italy with larger numbers than pretty much anywhere else but china we i just heard today that actually some italians went back to china and infected some chinese people <laughs> Uh, so it's 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 big, yeah. and of course the press continued telling the story as a tragedy because at some point that was the tone, and that was where the politicians could have changed the tone. They could have taken this with you know the if you if I as look they at have that, here, I mean largely here the tone is don't worry we're we're going to cope it'll be all right so, exactly yeah, here yeah. You, you, you what everything you hear well, is whether very, that's true or not it's, it, not, it's very but I. But this, the narrative is important yeah. because the narrative does change totally. the behavior of people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, oh, we're cool, we're fine. You know, it's going to be tough, but everybody wash their hands and, mm -hmm. you know, be cool is, 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 is a completely different yeah. type of narrative. And the thing is, if we would treat global warming as the tragedy that it actually potentially, I mean, that might actually kill us all yeah. much more than the coronavirus. Yes. Yes. Uh, so it's all about ha the, the the framing of the story. Getting the virus is probably lucky because you then don't have to face the horrors that's <laughs> <laughs> of, of global warming. That's right. But that but that in itself 
<laughs> it's funny, and this is going to sound fatalistic, if not nihilistic, but, you know, I said earlier, we, we are all going to die. And, you know, earlier on I was hearing about people who are making quite extreme efforts. Oh, in fact, I read a story on, on the way out that the, the very wealthy people are trying to jump the queue for the virus and are sort of offering to pay lots of money to get it to bypass all the normal, uh, you know, um, uh, an antidote to it, yeah. you know, that they'll jump the queue or they'll, they'll get it to bypass the normal testing and whatever else, you know. <laughs> exactly. And... Honestly, if you're healthy, I mean, unless you're not, if, unless you're not an old billionaire, but if you're a yeah. middle-aged billionaire, you know, find somebody who has it, kiss them in the mouth, you catch it, you're gonna be mildly sick for two weeks, and then you I know, know and but it, but it's it's the fact we that they we should sell this, this too. We should find somebody sick and sell. Well, the idea, them. yeah, yeah. But no, it's the, it's the fact that we all feel that we have, you know, six score years and ten, as as a, as a right. You know, to live forever. Yeah, and 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 that will be a long and happy life. You know, we've been sort of conditioned and brought up to think that that's the norm, and if we don't get the norm, we go out. We, yeah, we get we're bent entitled out. to a certain yeah, amount of it, happiness. It, it, and, exactly yeah. that. And, and whereas actually, in real life, this shit happens all the bloody time. You know, and and it's almost that contrast between what we've been led to expect <laughs> and the fact that no, actually, life's messy, dangerous, and and you die, and we're not really equipped. And like I said, it's not. I'm not saying give up. I'm not. I'm not saying become apathetic and, and, and whatever about it, but it's the way we are so bent out of shape by things that are actually just part of the normal you know, passage of life. I think that uh, what we need to all learn to do better is uh, storytelling, is, yeah. uh, you know, the narration of of, exper- yes. of human experience. The sense making of the whole. I think one of the, the challenges of, you know, modern social media, the way that, what has mostly become, not yeah. exclusively, is that, uh, you know, I don't share bad news. I mean, I don't even no, share experience. I mean, so. I, I, yeah. I share the occasional happy photo yeah. when yeah. something nice happens. Yeah. And everybody does it. So basically what you're representing, you're only catching the happy moments of everybody, mm-hmm. which on one side is good mm-hmm. in a sense i have uh there is a i i have the um amazon photo storing app which every day sends me a notification show me the photos of the today the previous years yeah that's what i like about facebook as well and, and yeah, yeah i mean nice. but this is up with all my photos and of yeah. course i have way more photos than what i posted on facebook yeah. i mean i have twenty six thousand. Well, photos. photos on the iphone does the same thing it'll prompt me with memories you have you, yeah. this does it every day yeah and i think it's interesting because actually i say of course i only have photos of happy times so even photos in you know, peers I know were pretty dark. Yeah. I mean, if I see a photo, the photo is a good photo. It's something positive that happened even in a shitty moment. Yeah. And it's interesting because that basically, so to some degree, it helps you seeing things in perspective, seeing the things yeah. it was not but, but all then, dark. But then m- memories are, are like that. I mean, I, you know, I oh. d- did a post the, the, the other day about partial truths or something I call it. I can't remember what I call it. But it's the fact that, you know, not only do we f- physically filter the environment around us. We only see certain spectrums, we only, we, we only hear certain things, and we then only pay attention to a very small subset of what's happening around us. And then we assign meaning to that on the basis of culture and, and pre-experienced yeah. ideas, all of which are then themselves only experienced in this moment, pre-filtered, blah, blah, blah. So the whole thing is incredibly unrelated to the actual world around oh, us. You know? that, that, there, is a, there is a good uh, short documentary on Netflix, I think one of, the, of well, those produced by the Vox about how things work. Oh, yeah, little short, yeah they're great. Yeah. 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 And, uh, and basically it explains how every time you remember something, you actually change the memory. Exactly, bit. yes. So they did a research on... Uh, um, everybody remembers where they were on 9-11. Mm-hmm. Turns out that what everybody remembers is very loosely related to the truth. Yeah. I mean, they were uh, interviewing people who remember seeing the smoke through the window of the school. <laughs> yeah. Turns out that their school was a place where there was no smoke and actually was orientated in the wrong oh, direction. I've done, I've done jury duty twice, and that is terrifying. Because all these people confidently stand up and tell you exactly what happened, and it's all different. They tell... They, they, so, but they tell you what they... What they yeah. What I was uh, what I was trying to say is that on one side, yeah, we only capture happy moments on social media. Mm-hmm. This also means that we have a very partial 
description of human life. I mean, mm -hmm. the fact that it would be good from time to time to share, you know, I'm not saying sad, but maybe more thoughtful moments and having kind of a more truth narrative. Well, I try. Because otherwise, oh, no, you do, you're doing a great job about it, but you're <laughs> the only person I know that does it. So, you know. But that's why. And, pe and people have been very positive about my will. I mean, I, and I've only told a very small percentage of the sort of shit that happens to me. But um, I do that with the hope that it encourages more people to do it because I worry about this sugar-coated bubble that we're all brought up to live in. Not that, Again, not that I want people to go about being gloomy or whatever, but just more, more real. equipped, real, equipped to deal with real, you know? Yeah. yeah. No, it, it's it's uh, probably something that we need more of is uh, a little bit more reality mm. in in uh, in social media. Yeah. Something less uh, sugar coated, less which uh, we all have control of. Oh, totally. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's difficult because uh, you know being more humans, I mean, being being more vulnerable, yep. and it's Exposing not something. It, it's it's, it's, it's yeah. you know sharing happy photos is the safest thing you can do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, but on the other hand, I I I get much more value from you know your feed on Facebook mm. than you know most other people because there are true stories. I mean. Mm. I still remember the post he wrote about use, using a screwdriver in an un, uncomfortable situation and you kind of meditating about oh, that yeah, moment. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. every time I find myself doing some, <laughs> you know, the art of I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm there, and I, I don't think about my, you know, all my meditations. I think about you and think about you. And, <laughs> and, it, and it's... Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And it's I, so, so that must be so 10 years ago at least. That's really interesting because that sort of takes us back to almost where we started about the willingness to learn from this stuff or the unwillingness and, and the fact that it's become, it's taking so long for it to gain traction in the workplace. And I think it's partly because the only, it will only become useful in the workplace when people talk about what actually happened. And that feels like a very risky thing to do when your annual pay and your, and your grades and your boss's perception of you can be affected by that. But that's where things like after action reviews or whatever else never work because they, you, they only get the funny gloss of, or trying to copy somebody else's, you know, people who stand up on stages and tell you what they did. That's not what happened. You know, that, that was the airbrushed, you, you know, they were lucky and you're not like them anyway kind of stories that are, are so unhelpful. So I think that is that, it's partly that cultural disinclination to admit you screwed up in, in the workplace that's actually holding an awful lot back at the moment. Yeah, I, I guess it, the, and it applies across the whole spectrum is if it's not true, it's not very useful and there is so many fake yeah. in, information or very artificially created yeah, yeah. Uh, BS, in, yeah. especially in a business whole environment. Whole departments are to doing that. And it's... Uh, and it's yeah. It's dreadful because then people don't do it yeah. or don't use it. It's like, it's something I absolutely don't understand about people writing long articles on LinkedIn about nothing. And I and I keep seeing this stuff in my stream. Know, and every, every once in a while, I want to approach people and say, is it working for you? Is it doing anything for you? Because I... For some time, I had the feeling, so, oh, maybe I should write something. <laughs> but I think I don't. Is and look, don't get me wrong. There are there is some yeah, very some good, good stuff. stuff. Yeah. I mean, there is a, yeah. anybody who can tell a real experience doing something yeah. is interesting. Yeah. I mean, I can watch an hour of a guy driving a truck on YouTube just because I find his experience yeah, Kev, Kev interesting. Is fabulous. Yeah. Or I can watch half an hour of somebody removing rust from an old tool <laughs> in order to make it all shine and again. I mean, yeah. I, I can do that. You, you need to get out more, Paul. Maybe. Uh, but uh, from that point of view, probably uh, yeah. YouTube is interesting because on YouTube yeah. you find a lot of content uh, which is much less polished to some degree. Yes. Even if it's video, if you think about it, the, the you know threshold to producing video is higher. Yeah. I mean, it, it's not as easy as posting something. But, but it's so much easier than it used to be. And, and 
the technology and the quality is so accessible. Is, is, yeah, yeah. I find a lot of very interesting video on YouTube of people having experiences, traveling, going places, yeah. doing things. Uh, yeah. uh, even recently, we had the opportunity of, of creating a few videos where we show how we do things in you know our yeah. design process, and they resonate with people. They say, oh, it's not somebody expressing an opinion, it's somebody showing you how to do something. Yeah. And it's, and, and it's uh, almost, I was mean, just talking to, to a friend earlier about the overproduced risk, you know, where it, it, people try too hard to make it look like professional television, just at the point where many of us are not trusting the professional television. And that rough authenticity of somebody just being enthusiastic about what they do and what they know can be so compelling and so effective in as a means of learning. And, and I think, again, this is where podcasting... <clears throat> where podcasting is an untapped resource in the world of work because just getting a couple of your nerds to talk about something they're grappling with uh, could pass on so much more than than the packaged, sanitized stuff we tend to get. Probably what is, what is interesting of uh, YouTube as a platform compared to, to podcasting is that uh, they have a search tool. So it's yes. easy to find a video that covers something that you need specifically. It's much harder to find a podcast that covers, especially if you need, you know, I need to learn about something specific. Podcasts tend to be kind of more of a long form. You know, I subscribe, I kind of, I, I won't be, I don't think that many people will be just listening to, you know, a half a piece of this podcast, even because probably there's nothing to learn from <laughs> it, uh, but, and just move away. Yeah. If anybody is listening to me, they are subscribers. Thank you very much. Yeah. Tell all your friends. Yeah. Uh, but um, yes. it's, 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 it's a, a different, different type of, different type, uh, yeah. of YouTube, from that point of view, is very well designed to, you know, find a specific video that tells you how to use that feature in a piece of software or how to screw together yes. two pieces. I mean, it's... But it's, isn't that partly because of the nature of YouTube that I, it, it's unlike, unusual for me to sit and watch anything for any length of time because it takes more investment. I have to stop doing other things and look at it. What I've been really pleased with is Castro, the uh, podcasting app for iOS has now got a feature where you can, within the iOS, uh, send a YouTube link to Castro and it will extract the audio and turn it into a podcast into what it calls its sideloads, sideloads function. Mm -hmm. So there's quite a lot of podcasts, sorry, YouTube videos that I now listen to as podcasts and that's, uh, even if they weren't intended as such, and especially if it's a talking head, anything over 10 minutes, it's much better to do it that way. But yeah, you're right, the short, hard-hitting, this is the solution to X, Y, or Z, that's then got a label that makes sense that you can then find that bit of video. I mean, it's interesting because Spotify are sort of muscling into the whole podcast world at the moment, and I've forgotten the name of it, but there was another podcast platform that uh, Russell Brand moved off to. There was yeah. a subscription. We are on that platform too. But yeah, 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 I remember yeah. you said, yeah. And I've just... I'm afraid not follow them because I don't want platforms getting in the way of my access to podcasts. That that to me seems like a retrograde step. But if there was another means of being able to discover, so 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 discoverability may be a consequence of people like Spotify and this other platform muscling in, but it would be at a cost as well. Well, you look know, if any of these platforms decides, and I'm not, maybe somebody's already doing it. I'm not aware of to just do it. Uh, text make a, a, a yeah. speech to text yeah. conversion and make it searchable which is what by the way youtube does yeah. i mean any video you upload to youtube they create the subtitles automatically Be interesting to see how well they coped with us <laughs> uh, i think that i don't I understand you i'm sitting opposite you i think, think that I, I i well actually it's very easy to know because all our podcasts are automatically republished on uh, youtube so all you have to do, that. you go to the State oh, really? of the Net channel on YouTube, I didn't you turn know. on subtitles. Well, there you go. I've just you... learned something from this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> you see? And you didn't even have to download it. Yeah. All right. And then... Should we quit while we're ahead? Yes, absolutely. We've just, we've just served up a learnable moment. We, we have been useful for a second. <laughs> Let's not spoil it. All right. Thank you very much for listening, everybody. And and we'll see you next time. Or hear you next time. Or whatever. Bye.